my pleasure to introduce uh, Davy Perrick. Um, she is uh, a researcher in computer vision. She's on the faculty at TTI Chicago, which is uh, Toyota Technological Institute. For if you haven't heard of it, it's a it's a, essentially a separate university on the University of Chicago campus. Uh, they have their own uh, degree PhD program and uh, their own uh, researchers and tenure track faculty and everything. Um, and uh, they're especially strong in a number of uh, areas like uh, computer vision and machine learning and a few others. Um, so uh, Davy uh, got her degree at Carnegie Mellon in 2009 and uh, she has worked with collaborators at, at lots of different places like MIT and UT Austin and, and other places. And uh, she's an expert in object recognition. And her, uh, her paper on relative attributes just won the Mar Prize at uh, this year's ICCV, which is basically the, the best, best paper prize at the best uh, computer vision conference. So with that, David. Thank you. Um, thanks, Steve. Thanks for inviting me. And thank you all for coming. Um, so let's get started. So I'm going to start by um, telling you a story about computer vision. Um, the year is 1966, and a revolutionary AI researcher and soon to be Turing Award winner um, is a professor at MIT, Marvin Minsky. And he um, assigns an undergraduate student a summer project. Right? And, and it's a simple task. Um, he tells a student to take a camera, um, link it to a computer, and get a computer to describe what it sees. Right? Simple enough. Well, that project didn't go too well. It hasn't been finished, and here we are 45 years later, um, and unfortunately, computer vision is far from being solved. Right? Um, so either thousands of researchers going to computer vision conferences every year are sort of not the smartest lot out there, which is possible, or <laughs> computer vision is just a really hard problem to solve. right? And, and given the fact that more than 50% of our brain is dedicated to visual processing, I'm inclined to go with the latter assumption, that computer vision is a really hard problem to solve. So I don't want to paint an overly pessimistic picture. Um, we have come a long way. Um, we can now look at images of handwritten digits and under the right conditions recognize what these digits are. Um, we can now download apps and install them on our smartphones and use those to recognize object instances like paintings or book covers or landmarks of famous or, or pictures of landmarks. Um, we can also use sensors like Kinect and immerse ourselves in virtual worlds much better and we can play video games without using remote controls, which is awesome. Um, and starting from the days when faces were represented with these ASCII characters with the right intensities, we can now use our cameras to detect faces in natural looking images. And not just faces, we can also detect people in somewhat natural looking images. Um, but if you look at the entire picture, there's still a long way to go, right? There are some false detections. We find people when they don't really exist and some bounding boxes are not quite well aligned. Um, if you look at more examples, we find a lot of the reasonable people um, in this picture, but then we also hallucinate, we hallucinate people in flowers and lampposts and so on, right? So things aren't, work they're working reasonably well, but not that great. And then in some cases, it's just disastrous. These are all the people, <laughs> these, are, these are all the people we find in this image and that's clearly not right. So if you look at the state of affairs for a lot of computer vision problems, this is where we find ourselves, right? You can sort of plug in any task more or less here and there's a large gap in accuracies between how well machines perform and how well humans perform. And we're all, the computer vision community is here to try and bridge this gap, right? And there are two main reasons for why I think this gap still exists. One is that there's just no good way to answer the question, how do we make progress? If you, if you look at the community, there's no consensus on which directions we should be pursuing to make progress in terms of advancing computer vision. And we all sort of come up with our models that make sense. We work hard at trying to get them to work on data sets. And sometimes they work, more often than not, they don't work. And we just don't know if we are investing all our time and effort into directions that matter the most. And so what I wanted to do was to take this gap that we have between human and machine performance and systematically analyze it to figure out which directions should we be focusing on to fill this gap as fast as we can. 
And it, it, it seems like it only makes sense to try and use humans to figure this out because humans are a working system of what we're hoping to achieve. Humans, humans are that performance that we're trying to get to and it only makes sense to try and use them in, in, in to systematically analyze where this gap is coming from. And so what we did was we introduced this paradigm of human debugging that does exactly that. And over the course of the talk, it will become clear what I mean by human debugging. The second reason for this gap, I think, is because of the well-known semantic gap between what machines can understand and how humans communicate. And if you think about it, humans are the users of our systems, for example, with image search, and they are the teachers of these systems, like training robots and training the vision systems. And it, it, in order for humans to be effective at playing either of these roles, be it users or teachers, there has to be a good way for humans and machines to communicate with each other. And that's what will be the second part of my talk. So the outline for today's talk, as I said, the first part I'll talk about um, human debugging and I'll give you one example of how we've used human debugging to figure out which way we need to head to make progress. In the second part, I'll describe my efforts on enhancing the mode of communication between humans and machines. Um, and apart from leveraging humans to advance vision, I've also done several other, pro I've also worked on several other problems that are perhaps more traditional computer vision and I'll try and give you a glimpse of a couple of those projects. Um, and I'll finally describe in my future work. And if there are any questions at any point, I, I assume it's okay for you to interrupt. All right, let's get started with the first part, human debugging. So I'm gonna explain what we mean by human debugging with this one application of person detection. Um, the task is given an image. You want the machine to generate bounding boxes around where it thinks people are. So that's the task that we're looking at. Um, this, is an, this is a useful task. It has many applications. For example, in our autonomous driving, you want to be able to detect people on roads before you run into them. Um, and also for surveillance applications, you want to be able to understand human activity, and so you want to detect people in videos. And this is an extremely challenging problem because humans have a variety of appearances. They can be in different poses, different scales, and all, all the problems that affect most computer vision um, problems are, are present in this application. So as I showed you, that person detection today, this is the output of a real detector, works reasonably well, but it has several problems, several false positives, several false negatives, and so on. So how does a state-of-the-art person detection system these days work? It's a parts-based model, so what it does is the first thing that you have to do is extract some features from your images, right? They may be color features, they may be intensity features, or they may be gradient information like edges and so on. So you have to first have a representation for your images. And the next thing you do is you try and detect individual parts of a person individually. For example, heads and torsos and legs and so on. So instead of trying to find the whole person at once, you first find individual parts. So what you'll do is you'll take your image, you'll look at each local patch in this image and try and classify it as belonging to one of several different parts. For example, heads, torsos, legs and so on. And what this gives you is a detection mask or a score on the entire image that tells you how likely is each one of these locations to be any one of these parts, right? The next thing you need to do is have some sort of a spatial model that stitches these individual part detectors together, right? So you have this um, part detection score that tells you where each part is likely to be present, and you consider each window in this, in this detection score and evaluate it by a spatial model that assesses how likely is this configuration of part detections, how likely is this configuration to be a valid person, right? And this now will give you a score map on the entire image that tells you how likely is each location to be a person. And finally, if you just take this score map and if you just threshold it, you will get a whole bunch of windows that are above this threshold that all really correspond to one person in the image. So you have to do something like non-maximal suppression to clean this up so that you get unique detections for each person in the image. And you might also look at some sort of contextual reasoning that if, if on the left is the output are all the detectors that your, all the detections that your detector finds, you might look at the 3D layout of the scene or just the horizon to realize that these are the only scales and locations that make sense. And so you might prune a lot of the false positives out. So this is a pipeline of a state of the art person detection in computer vision today. And if I ask you the question, which one of these components would you focus on to further improve it, right? Or in other words, which component is the weakest link in this pipeline? Or if you think of research as graduate student descent, 
in which direction would you point your graduate student to dedicate his or her entire thesis on? Would it be the part detections? Would it be the spatial modeling? Which, which component, right? And there's no good way to answer this right now. So what we do is we use our proposed paradigm of human debugging to answer exactly this question. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this pipeline. We will choose any one component. We will swap the machine out and plug a human being in instead. Everything else stays the same. Everything before and everything after stays the same. The only thing that's changed is this one component is now being performed by a human being instead of a machine. Right? So just like the input of the previous pipeline was an image and the output was a set of boxes that tell you where people are, the same thing is true for the second one. So these are both valid person detectors. Right? And you can do this for several different components. You can do this for combinations of components. And these are all valid person detectors whose performances you can now compare to get a sense for which component matters the most. Yes? So, uh, you've implicitly assumed the pipeline is correct. So how do you know when that's the case and when you need to work on the pipeline instead? I will get to that in about five minutes. And if I haven't answered your question, I can. So the question was, how do I know whether this pipeline is the right one to be working with or not? And I'll get to that in a few minutes. All right. So with this, you can now put together all these interesting detection detectors that are formed by various components being performed by humans and machines. And the only reason we can imagine doing something like this is because we now have access to crowdsourcing services where people like me can upload these individual tasks that need to be done by humans. And there are millions of people online who will log in, perform these tasks for me, and get paid in return. Right? Because there's going to be a large component of doing many, many human studies in this work. So how we do these human debugging depends on how we plug in humans into these different components and these different sub pipelines in this whole pipeline. And so there are several tasks that we had to design that mimic humans performing individual components or combinations of components. And this is the list of all those tasks. And I'll slowly walk you through each one so that you get a sense for how these tasks were designed. So let's get started with the first one. If I want human subjects to perform the entire task of person detection on their own, then how do I do that? That's fairly straightforward, right? I show them an image, and I ask them to draw boxes around where they think people are. So in this case, they're using the input of the pipeline as input, and they produce an output, and they've implemented the whole pipeline. So when I say this, I don't mean that people are using this pipeline in their heads to solve the problem. That's not what I mean at all. I just mean that whatever the input of this pipeline was, it's the same input that we gave to human subjects. And whatever output we expect from the pipeline, it's the same output that was produced by human subjects. OK, so this is straightforward. Now, what if I want humans to act as the first three components, but not do non-maximal suppression? Right? How do we do that? Well, just like with machines, we show them individual windows from the image and ask them for each one, is this a person or not? We do the same thing with human subjects. We'll extract these windows from images, and for each one, ask them, is this a person or not? And that will, again, give us a map on the entire image of how likely there is a person there, and you can then follow it up with a machine non-maximal suppression. So here's a slightly tricky one. What if I want humans to do the entire pipeline except, except the feature extraction? Right? So here, what we would ideally like to do is force humans to use a certain set of features and use those to do person detection. But that's how do, how do I force you to use histogram of oriented gradients? Right? That's, that's, that's not something we can do. But what we can do is hold information from you. So instead of showing you the whole image, if we only show you the gradients, then while I don't, I don't know what you are using, I know that you're not using color information and you're not using intensity information. Right? So we can restrict the information that you have access to as a way for tweaking this feature selection box. And again, we now ask you, draw boxes around where you think people are. And what you've done is essentially implemented the last three components. If we now want you to do only the part detection and spatial modeling, but not the feature extraction or non-maximal suppression, then well, we extract windows from these gradient or other feature visualization images and ask you for each one, is this a person or not? Right? Yes? They have the same set of gradients as the other image, or are they some, some other representation of the gradient of the, of the original images? So these gradients are the gradients of the original image. Was that the question? Yeah, like, but the, the gradients of these images wouldn't match the gradient of the original image, right? So I'm not sure sense. what you mean by the gradients of which images wouldn't match the gradients of which <coughs> image. Mm. 
So the gradients of these images would not be the gradients of that image right, because right. these are the gradients of that image. Yeah. Yes, yes. But that's why we are changing the feature representation that you have access to, right? All right. Um, so now a slightly different task. If we want you to act as the feature extraction and part detection blocks, but not everything else, then what we're going to do, again, is exactly what we do with machines. We extract individual patches out of context from these images and ask you to classify each patch as belonging to one of six different part categories. And what that would give us is a visualization that looks something like this. Hopefully, you can see it at the back, that each color corresponds to six different parts. And the intensity of the color corresponds to how, what the conference was for that part, that patch being the corresponding part. Right? So in this case, just like you would have with machines, the input were these local patches, and the output is a part detection score on the entire image. Except this score is now generated by humans instead of machines. If we wanted to restrict the features, we extract these patches from only the gradient or low resolution images and we get a corresponding part detection score, which will presumably be much noisier if the input information was weaker. Now a slightly different task again. What if we want to have human subjects act, act as the spatial modeling and the non-maximal suppression components, but not the feature extraction or part detection? Right? So in this case, the input to a human subject needs to be the part detection, and the output needs to be a person detection. Right? And that's exactly what we do. We show you this visualization, and we ask you to draw boxes around where you think people are. Now, if we don't want you to do non-maximal suppression, then, well, we'll extract windows from these visualizations, and for each one, ask you to classify them as being a person or not. Right? So I'm sure some of you are wondering, how do we look at this visualization and decide that this is a person? Right? Why would this look like a person? The reason it would is because we would train you for it. We would, just like a machine, we would show you positive examples of this visualization that correspond to people, and we would show you negative examples of this visualization that do not correspond to people, we will tell you what these colors mean, so you can use your inbuilt spatial models to decide which configurations are valid people and which ones are not. And if you think about it, what we've done is created artificial, artificial intelligence, right? Which is the, sub, which is the slogan of Mechanical Turk, that we're forcing human beings to act as artificial intelligence machines in trying to solve this problem. Yes? Do you allow people to do something other than yes or no? Because with a scenario like this, it seems highly contrived to force somebody to say either yes or no? So we, we don't. We don't. We force them to say either yes or no. Um, but what we do is we get multiple responses from people. And so that gives us an estimate of confidence. If people just had no idea, then half the people would say yes, half the people would say no. And that would essentially give us an estimate of confidence that this is 0.5 likely to be a person or not. And this mimics exactly what we force machines to do. Right? When we give them a classification problem, they either have to say yes or no and go with that. So it mimics exactly that. All right, so with that, we have all these tasks in place um, that we can use for our various person detectors. And we've implemented all these different combinations. So what we can do is now compare different combinations of these detectors to find out which components matter how much. Right? Um, so we're going to do exactly that. Here, what I'm showing you is, how, is, is trying to quantify how much the part detection block matters. So what I'm showing you are results on two different data sets. The first is um, INRIA, and the second one is Pascal, which is more modern and more challenging. And on the y-axis is, um, is accuracy, if you will, so the higher the better. And what I'm showing you in red are the, with the accuracy with machine parts, and in green is the accuracy with human parts. And I'm showing you results on three different tasks. Right? The first task is when we're using humans as a sliding window to classify each one of these windows as being a person or not. Right? The second is when we're using a machine as a sliding window to classify each one of the same windows as being a person or not. And the third one is when we're using humans as the detector to look at this entire visualization and draw boxes around where they think people are. So these are three different tasks. And in all of them, we can compare what happens if you have machine parts versus human parts. And the same thing for Pascal. And what we find, especially in the challenging Pascal data set, is that there's a significant improvement performance if you use human detected parts as opposed to machine detected parts. Right? And if I show you some examples of what these part visualizations look like, it'll be clear why that is the case. These are the outputs of humans detecting parts in these two images. And as you can see, that people make a lot of mistakes because they're looking at local individual patches and making independent decisions about each one being a head or a torso and a leg. And so what happens is when you look at the horse leg out of context, it looks like a leg. And you're going to say that those are legs. And that's why you get these 
mistakes in part detections right here. But if you still compare the human part detection to machine part detections, it's significantly cleaner. Right? And so that gives you a sense for why we're getting better accuracies. Another way of looking at it is if I extract windows that, that, do, have a pe that do have a person using human detected parts, and these are the negative windows for the same thing, there's a clear difference in the signal. Right? But if you look at the machine equivalent of that, the classification task is much harder. And so you can look at, you can evaluate this for parts, for spatial models, for non-maximal suppression. And I'm just going to give you the summary here that the component that matters the least is the spatial models. This is the difference that you get in whether you use machine spatial models or human spatial models. The next one is actually non-maximal suppression. This is the difference in accuracies that you can get by using human non-maximal suppression as opposed to machine non-maximal suppression. And finally, this is the difference that parts can make using human parts versus machine parts. And you see that the human parts are much more important. So it's important to note that all these results are subject to the choice of visualization that we made. Right? If we made this visualization much harder, in the limit if I just showed you the pixel intensities as real numbers and asked you to decide if this is a head or not, this, that just wouldn't work well. Right? So what we give you are lower bounds on the potential that each one of the components have. Right? And if we had better visualizations, for example, this is each face is a visualization of an 18-dimensional feature vector. Each number in that feature vector has been mapped to a facial feature location or orientation of eyebrows and things like that. And we know that people are very sensitive to changes in facial expressions. Right? So if we had a way to convert the information that we want to show people into things that use the natural visual pathways, for example, these faces, that would be really nice. But we don't know how to do that beyond just 18 numbers. Right? All right, so this still, even, even though it's a lower bound, it's a valid lower bound. It's, we have humans as a feasible point. And what this clearly tells you is that if you focus on the very specific task of taking 24 by 24 patches and classifying them into being one of six different part categories, if you, if you, if you just had much better performance on this very specific task, the overall performance of the system would be much better. And this is something that the community did not know before and that we could contribute in. Right? So coming back to the question about the pipeline. So what, what we know so far is that each co this is the importance of each component. But what about the potential of the pipeline as a whole? How do we know if this pipeline is even a good pipeline to be working with? So what we can do is, is what I'm showing you here. We're comparing three different things. The first, the blue bar, is when humans look at the entire image and do person detection. So the accuracy is almost perfect. Right? The second one, the green one, is when humans are forced through each component in this pipeline. So it's still all humans, but they're forced through this pipeline. And that's the performance in green. And in red is the performance when a machine is going through this pipeline. Right? So the fact that there's not much of a gap here tells you that this pipeline is not a bad one to be working with. And the fact that there's a large gap here shows that there's a lot of room for improvement. And in the previous slide, we were able to decompose this improvement in terms of these three parts, th the three components that are involved in the pipeline. Yes. Is the optimal pipeline for a human is different than the optimal pipeline for a computer? Absolutely. It is possible that the optimal pipeline for a human, when forced through that pipeline, is different from the optimal pipeline of a machine. But, and that's, again, why we say that this is only a lower bound. We, can, we could expect machines to do better than humans at, at some task. And so this is only a lower bound on the potential. Yes. So we've looked at human debugging for several different applications. This is only one problem of person detection. We've looked at image classification, where we evaluated the roles of features versus algorithms versus training data, and see which one is most important for better image classification. And what we found, that image representation or the features are the most important. And so we dove into that a little bit more and analyzed what about the features is what's lacking. Do we need better local representations of images, or do we need better global representations of images? And what we found was that we need to focus on better global representations of these images. And again, looking at that a little bit more, we evaluated one source of global information, which is contextual information. And what we wanted to look at were different sources of contextual information that the vision community uses and evaluate, is there a source of context that humans use that existing vision algorithms are not using? And we were able to, to find one such source that humans use but machines were not using, build a model for that, and plug it into existing object detectors and significantly improve performance. Yes? Global marked in the second item, but your pipeline, the way you were describing it, seemed that that first step made things very local. So I'm, I'm a, and it seemed to work okay. So that. Right. So the, 
right? So the two tasks involved are different, right? When you're looking at person detection, that is a local task in its nature. You want to draw a bounding box specifically around a local object. Here, what we're looking at is image classification. So it is a much more global task. And so you would expect these different components to potentially have different roles for the different problems. That is all I wanted to say about human debugging. So I'm going to start with this um, example, that traditional recognition, the way it works is we teach machines, machines several concepts by giving them example images, right? So we teach it that this is what a dog looks like, this is what a chimpanzee looks like, and this is what a tiger looks like, right? And now if I give it images from one of these three categories, if we're lucky, it'll get it right, right? But what if I give it an image of this and ask it, what is this? Right? There's nothing intelligent it can say. All it can say is it's not a dog, it's not chimpanzee, and it's not tiger, right? But instead, instead of just teaching it these category names, if you had also taught it properties of these objects, right? If you told it that this thing that's here is furry and it's white, and this thing is black and it's big, and that this thing is striped and it's yellow, and perhaps also teach it what the category names are, then given this image, a category that it has never seen before, it still can't tell you that this is a zebra, but now at least it can say something intelligent, that I don't know what this is, but it's striped, it's black, it's white, and it's big. Right? And this is exactly what attribute-space recognition lets you do. So there are a couple of things you can do with attribute-space recognition. One thing that you can do is zero-shot learning. So if, my, if I've never given an example of a zebra to a machine, I can still just describe it as being something that's white, big, and striped. And now give it an image of a zebra, there's potential that it will correctly classify it as being a zebra, even though it's never seen other examples before. Right? And the flip side of it is, is sort of the other way around, where if it's, if it's never seen zebra images before, given a zebra image, it may not be able to say anything. It may not be able to say that this is a zebra, but it can still textually describe it as being striped, black, white, and so on. So it, it, you can see how attributes go, let you go both ways. So what are, what are attributes? Just to give you a better definition of what I mean by these. They are mid-level concepts, so they are higher than just low-level features in the image but they're lower than these high-level concepts that are categories. Um, they're shareable across related categories. And they're human understandable, so they have names associated with them, and they're machine detectable. You can train models to detect these attributes and images. And so what's great about attributes, or at least what I find most exciting, is because of the last two properties, they're a great mode of communication between humans and machines. They are something that they can both understand. Right? And attributes have been looked at quite a bit, especially in the last few years, but there has been a very narrow view of attributes, especially when you think of them as a mode of communication between humans and machines. Most works have only looked at attributes as being categorical. And so, for example, you can, all they let you do is relate concepts to properties. So you can say things like dogs are furry, right? But what we, that's, that's very restrictive. And so what we wanted to do was push that further and not only talk about concepts with respect to properties, but also relate concepts with respect to each other in terms of these properties. Right? So to give you a more concrete example, instead of just talking about rabbits or bunnies being furry and dogs being furry, you can also talk about bunnies being more furry than dogs. And this is something that existing work did not look at at all. And that's what relative attributes let you do as opposed to categorical attributes. And that was our contribution in the ICCV paper, that using relative attributes really lets you enhance the mode of communication between humans and machines. It gives you, an, it gives you a whole new dimension of ways to communicate to machines. And this has some really interesting applications. For example, if you think of image search, right? you Google for pictures of streets of Chicago, and you might get something like this back. Right? You had some picture in mind, but this is what you get back. And perhaps this picture is something like what you wanted, but you wish there weren't as many people and cars in the picture, right? So what you can say is, what I want is something like this, but less congested. And hopefully Google can then, if, if you had access to relative attributes, Google can return something like this. And again, the very natural way of doing this is in terms of these relative descriptions or relative attributes. Right? Here's another example. Let's say you were in Chicago, and unfortunately you got mugged. Right, so you go to the cops and you describe to them the person who you think mugged you, and they show you mug shots of, of likely people who may have mugged you. Right? And you can say that, no, the person who mugged me looked something like this, but wasn't smiling as much. Right? And again, that's a relative description. Right? 
So how would you model these relative attributes? Right? One way could be that, well, let's instead of having categorical attributes that something is either furry or not, let's just have continuous scores. Right? That's the most natural way of looking at it. But there's a problem with that. If I show you this picture and I ask you on a scale of one through four, how much is this person smiling? Where one is not smiling at all and four is smiling or not. Hopefully we all think it's a one, right? What about this person? We still mostly think it's a one, right? What about her? Oh, I thought it would be more like more three, maybe mostly four. But what about her? Right? Is it a two? Is it a three? Is it a square root of two? Is it 2.73? Right? It's just not, that's not how we think. We can't give numbers to these semantic concepts that we think about all the time. Right? But if I now ask you, is she smiling more or less than this person? We would all agree that she was smiling less. Right? So relative is just a much more natural way of thinking about these concepts. And so that's what we wanted to use to model these relative attributes. That's the form of supervision we want to use to model relative attributes. So how do we learn these relative attributes? For each attribute, let's say A sub M that we want to learn, let's say the attribute is open, we're going to use two modes of supervision. One is a set O of ordered pairs of images I and J that says image I is more open than image J. And the second is a set of unordered pairs of images I and J that says image I is as open as image J. And now what we want to do is we want to learn a linear scoring function that has these parameters W that we need to learn. And XI here are the image features that we have. And we want to learn this linear scoring function such that it satisfies the following constraints as best as it can. Right? For pairs I and J that belong to O, we want the score of image I to be greater than the score of image J, because I was more open than J. And for pairs of images I and J that belong to S, we want the score of image I to be equal to the score of image J. Now this, unfortunately, is an NP-hard problem to solve. So what we're going to do instead is, learn, is use a relaxation. We're going to use a max margin learning to rank formulation, where these constraints that I showed you on the previous slides convert into this. This first constraint that says the score of I should be greater than the score of J will just become a softer constraint that says the difference in the scores should be greater than some margin, which is one, and some slack variables. And this is for all pairs belonging to O. And for the second constraint that said the score of I and J should be equal will again be softened and relaxed to saying that the scores of I and J should be small. The difference in the scores should be small. And again, for all pairs in S. Right? So these slack variables need to be positive and they become a part of the objective function that we want to minimize in addition to some regularization term. Right? And this is a formulation that's based on the work of Joachim et al. So what this does pictorially is given a set of points in this feature space, which in our case are images, with their desired ranking, we want to learn a linear hyperplane such that the projection of these points on that hyperplane respects the ranking that we wanted. And the distance between the closest rank points is the rank margin, which is what we want to maximize in this formulation. So given this, we can now, given a new image, once we've learned the parameters, given a new image, we can predict a relative attribute score. Right? What can we do once we have these learned relative attributes? I'm going to show you a few different examples of things we can do with them. The first is zero-shot learning. And what I mean by zero-shot learning is that you have example images for some categories, for example, Hugh, Scarlett, and Jared. And you only have descriptions of some other categories. For example, you know that Clive is younger than Hugh, but older than Scarlett. You know that Miley is younger than Jared and that she smiles more than Jared. Right? So you have example images for three categories, and you only have descriptions of two categories. Right? Now how, given a test image, your task is to assign it to one of these five categories. How would you do that? Once you have relative attributes, you can use a very simple approach. You can just build a generative model in this relative attribute space. For the categories for which you have images, you can directly estimate the parameters of these categories. And for the categories where you only have descriptions, you can use very simple rules to directly translate the description into models in this space. So Clive's age is somewhere between Scarlett and Hugh. Miley smiles more than Jared and is younger than him. And you can build descriptions like these. And so now you have model for all five categories. There's no difference between the ones for which you had images versus didn't. And given a test image, you can assign it to anyone. Right? So again, once you have relative attributes as a way of communicating, you can use very simple approaches to do seemingly hard things. And we, we do this on a couple of data sets, on outdoor scene recognition and on face data sets. And we show that using on the x-axis is as you use fewer and fewer attributes to describe those categories for which you had no images. Right? And if you just use binary attributes, which was existing work, the performance degrades significantly. 
But if you use our proposed relative attributes, the performance is much higher, and it's much more robust to having fewer and fewer attributes. Here's another thing you can do with relative attributes. Given an image, you can describe it automatically. Right? With binary attributes, all you could say was that it's not natural, it's not open, and it has some perspective. Right? But with relative attributes, this description can be much more informative. You can say that it's more natural than inside city, but it's less natural than highway, and so on. And this has much more information in it. So we wanted to evaluate how much more information is there in these descriptions. And so we performed some human studies where this is what we did. We selected a secret image. We automatically generated a description of this image. This can be in terms of binary attributes or relative attributes. And we add in two random images as noise. Right? And we now remove the information that tells you which one is the secret image. And we present these three images plus the description to a human subject. And the human subject has to guess looking at the description and the images, which one of these images was the one being described. Right? If you can do this well, it means the description is good. If you can't do this well, it means the description is not good. Right? And we can compare bin binary attributes to relative attributes. And what we find is, as the first guess, humans can human subjects can recognize the correct image as being the secret image much more reliably with relative attributes than with binary attributes. Yes? So in both of these tasks, you only compared binary with relative. What about continuous? So we compared continuous. Um, we did compare it to continuous. I, I can show it. I have a backup slide that I can show you later. On, in zero-shot learning, what we find is that the performance is, it does something like this. So it is also robust to having fewer and fewer attributes because the descriptions are still relative. But if you just use continuous scores as output of binary classifiers, they perform worse than a ranking function because the ranking function is really trying to mimic the ranking, which the output of a binary classifier is not doing. Right. So going back to the image search example, um, we tried this with the image search as well. If you're looking for black shoes, these might be the images that you get back. And maybe what you had in mind was something that's more formal than these particular pairs of shoes and shinier than this one, and you can get an updated set of results. And you can evaluate how well do these results mimic what you had in mind, and what we find is something like this, where using relative attributes as a, as a mode of feedback does significantly better than just using binary relevance feedback. We can also use relative attributes for giving classifiers feedback. So if this is the image that needed to be classified, and the machine says that I think this is a forest, what do you think? Right? And the human can say, no, this is not quite a forest because it's too open to be forest. Right? And so giving this additional information that this is too open to be forest lets the classifier realize that any image that is even more open than this image could not have been a forest. And so the simple feedback can be applied to many more images. And again, we find that that significantly helps in terms of accuracies. You can learn much faster with the same amount of human input as you would if you didn't have access to these relative feedback. So I've also looked at a couple of different problems for attributes. One is, where does this vocabulary of attributes come from in the first place? Right? So we've looked at interactive approaches that let you automatically discover these attributes from a given data set. And we've also used attributes to understand that what are the properties of images that make some images more memorable than other images. And so these are a few other applications of attributes that I've, uh, that I've looked at that, again, rely on the fact that attributes are both machine detectable and human understandable. So before I move on um, to the next part of the talk, are there any more questions? When you uh, did the test with the, the image that you described and the two other uh, random images or uh, other images, uh, how do you, I mean, you could, you could make that test easier or harder by, based on how you chose those images. How did you do that? So we just, we just randomly um, choose, chose those two images. This was all a data set of outdoor scenes, or they were all faces. So they were, they were within a similar domain. So the images that you add in are relevant. But you should also note that if we make the task arbitrarily easy or arbitrarily hard, it would be the same for binary attributes and relative attributes. So that wouldn't presumably give us, it wouldn't bias the results in our favor or against us. It would be the same. If it was trivial, then they would both just have equal accuracies, and you wouldn't see a difference. All right. So in, in the third part, I wanted to just give you, a, give you a flavor for some of the other problems that I've looked at that perhaps fall within traditional computer vision a little bit more. 
Um, and so what I've done several works with contextual reasoning and images, interactive computer vision, some energy minimization. But what I'm going to give, talk about are two different projects where we were trying to model spatial structures in images. Um, so the first was trying to learn a hierarchical image representation. Right? So if you, if you look at the visual world around us, there are very predictable spatial patterns. Right? If you look at a street scene, then there's usually a building in the back. There are some people on the sidewalk. There's a street, and there are some cars on the street. Right? And so this is, this is very predictive. There's very predictable in a street scene. But it's not just predictable, it's also hierarchical in nature. So if you look at this car, then this car can again further be decomposed into this predictable spatial pattern of having two wheels and windows and so on. And so what we wanted to do was given a collection of images that have no annotations. So in an unsupervised way, we wanted to take these collections of images and identify these spatial patterns that are hierarchical in nature and identify them in this data set that would explain the data set well. Right, so you want to discover these hierarchical spatial patterns that occur in these images. And so what we used was a star graph model where each spatial pattern that we want to learn is represented as a star graph, such that the, given the parent, given the spatial pattern itself, given the mean location, there's a predictable mean location of all its children, right? and there's some covariance associated with this location. And we also modeled the probability of each one of these children being present given the parent. Right? And what makes this hierarchical is that each child can be a spatial pattern in itself. And so that then has its own children, and this gives you a hierarchy. Right? And what we found was that in, if given a test image, if you now want to decide which one of these spatial patterns should be instantiated in this image to explain the image best, then this inference problem, given our model, corresponds to the problem of finding the minimum Steiner tree in a directed acyclic graph. Right? And the way we learned these spatial patterns from the data set in the first place is through an EM-like approach where the inference plays a key role. And so with this, what we had was a new way of representing images. Instead of representing images just in terms of the local features, which is shown in red here, just instead of representing an image just in terms of these local features like most existing works do, we can now describe the image in terms of these hierarchical patterns that are all present in the image. And so with this new image representation, you can do things like object recognition and scene recognition like any representation, but you can do it much more effectively. Yes? How is this different from object detection grammars? How is this detect different from object detection grammars? It's, it's related to that, but it's, these are all learned in an unsupervised way given a wide collection of images, right? With object detection, you would still have to have labels for where the objects are, and then you can decompose it into grammars. So it's, it's related, it's just a different way of doing it. And this is more for image classifications. It's for building a representation of the image and not so much for a detection problem. Is there another? Okay. And the second um, that's related to this is modeling groups of objects. So if you, if you look at, um, if, you, if you're trying to detect bottles in images, right, then the bottle can look very different depending on which setting it's present in. Right? And, and one setting is sort of more acceptable than the other, but it's still, the appearance, the appearance, differ, the appearance differs depending in, in, in terms of which setting it's, it's present in. So if you, instead of, so the theory is instead of trying to just detect bottles irrespective of the setting they're present in, you want to be trying to detect these settings in themselves. So you want to be detecting groups of objects. So a person drinking from a bottle versus a, a bottle on a table with chairs around it. So if you, if you reason about these groups of objects, which are these settings, then you can do a much better job at scene understanding than trying to reason about the individual object itself. Right? But the question is, where do these groups come from? Right? Which groups should we be modeling? So there's been some recent work along these lines of modeling groups of objects. And what they did was they used a hand-generated list, hand list of groups that you should be modeling. Right? And so what they were working with are eight different object categories that have about 17 different what they called phrases, which is the same as groups of objects. And they had only two objects at most in a group. Right? And the main limitations of this is because this is a hand-generated list. Right? If you wanted to scale this up to thousands of objects and having higher order groups where different number of groups are participating, different number of objects are participating in a group, how would you do this? You can't expect to hand list this out for all these different settings. Right? And so what we wanted was an automatic approach to discover these groups of objects from images. So what you have are images where objects have been labeled, but the groups are not labeled. And you want to use these object annotations to figure out which groups 
occur frequently enough in this data set, and so it makes sense to model them. So what we used was a very simple Hopf transform-like framework that lets you detect these groups that co-occur. And it's, a, it's extremely efficient, and it can, let you detect, it can let you discover groups up to arbitrary orders. It scales very well with the number of objects participating in the group. And so what we could do was work with a data set that had about 107 different objects. We automatically discovered 71 groups, and the groups had as many as six different objects participating in them. So you can imagine if you had to look through all possible groups having six different objects, you couldn't do that manually. And so you need automatic approaches to discover these. And some examples of groups that we discovered, we found the little kid drinking bottle is the same as, as drinking from a bottle as the same as this person. So these are both instantiations of the same group. And these are two different instantiations of different groups, where there's an umbrella, a table, and chair, and so on. And as you can see, we can discover these, even if there are multiple instantiations of the group in the image, we can still discover those. And we showed that using these groups, you can do object detection much better. So what I'm showing you here are accuracies on a very challenging data set, where if you did not use any contextual information, if you just tried to identify the individual objects, this is the accuracy that you would get. Um, this is the performance of two state-of-the-art contextual models for object detection. And this is the performance that you get if you use our discovered groups. Again, they're discovered automatically as contextual information. Right? You can also use these groups for scene recognition, that you describe a scene in terms of which groups are present in the scene. And what we see is you can use several different descriptors, like the texture and the color information of a scene, and this is the performance that you get. You can look at the spatial pyramid descriptor, which is one of the state-of-the-art descriptors in computer vision. You can use a part space model for scene, and you can use all the objects that are present in the scene as a description for the scene, and these are the performances that you get. But instead of looking at objects, if you look at which groups are present in the image and use that for scene recognition, you do much better. Right? And finally, you can combine all the different sources of information except for groups. And this is the performance you get. And if you add in groups on top of that, you do much better. So this really shows you that modeling groups and discovering lots of these groups automatically is very effective for better image understanding. All right, so moving on to the last part, um, I'll, I'll try and describe some future work that I'm interested in. Um, the first, along the lines of human-machine communication, is really pushing for using these relative attributes for real large-scale systems. As I was describing, I think it's very, very relevant for something like image search. So what you have in Google right now is if you, just, if you search for some images, on the left, they show you this panel that lets you talk about, oh, I want images that are bigger or smaller, or that I want images that are of particular colors, or I want images that are of a certain type, like face and clip art and so on. And so they're sort of getting towards this sort of using attributes, but it's not quite there. They're not using these semantic attributes that let, you inter that let you interact with the system in a much more natural way. And so I'm really interested in pushing this forward. Um, and it's not just for image search, even for things like robot learning. Um, it would be interesting if you can teach the robots in terms of this natural language that you use, which attributes let you do. Um, and looking at, if you, if you want to use this for these large-scale systems, you have to be able to discover the vocabulary of attributes along the way. As the person is using the system, you have to be able to rebuild your models for different attributes that might come up as you are using the system. There's also the question of figuring out relevance of attributes with queries, right? If you're searching for shoes, then shininess makes sense. But maybe if I'm searching for a teddy bear, then shininess doesn't make so much sense, right? So figuring out which attributes should be used for which queries. Um, there's also the calibration issue between human perception and the models that machines build. Right? If I say that I want shoes that are shinier than this one, well, how much more shiny do they need to be before you think this, will be, this is shinier? Right? If it's just an epsilon improvement, you might not even be able to tell the difference. So calibrating these human perceptions um, to the models that we have in our machines would be important if you're trying to use them for real applications. The second is, I'm interested in building models that are interpretable. And if you build models on attributes, on top of attributes, then let these models be interpretable. Right? And if these models are interpretable by humans, you can then allow humans to directly edit these models to add in the domain knowledge. So I hinted at this at one of the applications of relative attributes. But it would be really interesting if we can build models and then allow humans to directly edit them by using this mode of communication that we have in terms of attributes. Right? And then interesting questions are, well, how do we incorporate different computer vision tasks into such a framework? What sort of models allow for such editing in the first place? How, what, what are the properties of the models that let you, let you have this role of editing? 
what's the interface for letting humans edit these models, right? And eventually, how do you transfer these edits into updates in the model in a principled manner? So along for human debugging, um, I mean, I've, I've shown you some work on human debugging for the classification or recognition task. But I'm also interested in using that for segmentation tasks. So for example, the task of unsupervised segmentation, right? Given an image, the task is to divide this image into regions that make sense, right? That's the only task. And there are several different cues that you can look at. One is you can look at low level information, that if, if colors are similar, perhaps it should be the same region, right? That's one cue. There can also be mid-level cues, that if you can tell that one object is in front of the other object, then perhaps they should be two different segments. And there's also high-level information. If I recognize the objects in the image, I will be able to segment them better. Right? So what are the roles of these three different things for unsupervised, rec for unsupervised segmentation? And you can use human debugging to figure this out. The second is using is the task of supervised segmentation. Right? The task is given an image. You want to label every pixel as belonging to one of several different semantic categories, like person and motorcycle and so on. And people have thrown in a lot of information at this problem. You try and detect the objects first before you segment them. You try and use the scene recognition approaches to figure out what scene this is to figure out which objects can be present here. You try and use shape priors to figure out which pixels should belong to the person or the motorbike. You use mid-level grouping cues, and there are many more cues that people throw at this task, but there's no sense of how much each one of these factors matter in the final segmentation accuracy. And again, we are interested in using human debugging to answer exactly this question, which one of these sources of information are important to be able to do supervised segmentation better. At a high level, I've shown several examples of how we've done human debugging for various problems. And I gave you one example of how we took something we learned and fed it back into an object detection system to improve the performance. But in general, I'd like to really push on taking the lessons we learn, using them to build better models, and show that we can do computer vision better once you use this human debugging pipeline. Right? And it's not just about computer vision. If you think about it, the only thing we rely on is the fact that humans are a working system. And humans are a working system of any AI system by definition. Right? So human debugging is very applicable even to things like speech recognition. And I'm talking to some researchers in trying to evaluate the role of the local acoustic models versus the language models in, 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 in how well speech recognition performs. And you can use human debugging for that, or even for machine translation, looking at the local model versus the language models for machine translation. Um, and this work, I think, is really exciting because it allows for a lot of collaborations. We, if, it would be really nice if we can collaborate with cognitive scientists and psychophysicists so that we know that we're doing these human studies the way they should be done and that they are best capturing the natural visual pathways for humans. Um, also working with data visualization people, we came up with these abstract visualizations of where parts are present in the image, and it would be really nice to have more natural visualizations of that. Um, and finally, collaborating with people working on these applications like speech and machine translation and roboticists and so on. So in conclusion, um, I started with this picture that the state of affairs in computer vision looks something like this, where machines are performing significantly worse as compared to humans. And my take on this in trying to bridge this gap was that, one, we, we should be using humans much better. We should leverage humans to try and figure out what, is, what are the main sources that lead to this gap in performance and focus our research efforts on those components. And that was the human debugging paradigm. I also talked about my work on enhancing human machine communication that allows you to bridge the gap between humans and the semantic gap between humans and machines. And that would let humans be much more effective users and teachers of the systems that we're building. And finally, overall, I'm interested in um, improved image understanding done automatically. And I presented a couple of problems in the end that were geared, geared towards that. So these are all the collaborators that I've been working with. The top row are students, and the bottom row are researchers and faculty at various institutions. And I'll end with that. Thank you. <laughs>